on August 8th, Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, and two other family women drove across this road from the Spawn Ranch to a house on 10050 Cielo Drive in Bel Air, where Sharon Tate, J. Sebring, Wojtek Frakowski, and Abigail Folger were murdered. The subsequent murders unleashed a tidal wave of panic and terror. Speculation in Los Angeles and the world as to the identity of the murderers ran rampant. Similar murders the next evening added a further frisson of fear. Actually, I wouldn't be here had it not been for those people you call family. They're the ones that put me here. They're the ones that butchered up a bunch of people and said, here, we want you to see this guy. I didn't want to be seen, you know. I was trying to get out in the desert. They said, well, this is our star. You dig what I'm saying? Uh, I would have went ahead and let you bleed in Elvis Presley. You dig? You could have had Elvis Presley for your little dreams. You dig what I'm saying? I didn't break the law. I got some friends that killed some people. But my friends have always been killing people. I've got a lot of friends that are very terrible people to other people. But to me, and they're just home, you know. You got to be responsible for your actions. I'm not your leader. I'm not your follower. Like the Kennedy assassination, the impact of the so-called Manson murders can never be fully understood. They entered immediately into the folklore of our time, an impenetrable cipher. It would be impossible to penetrate the fog of disinformation that covers these murders. The thick veil of rumors and theories, conspiracies and cover-ups that obscure the way. Were they the first casualties of a holy war? Tex Watson's revenge for a drug burn by Wojtek Frakowski? Susan Atkins' attempt at a copycat murder designed to free Bobby Beausoleil? Were the murderers strangers to the slain? There are only questions. The murders seem to echo the sordid epitaphs of old Hollywood in their excess. J. Sebring, the hairstylist to the stars, had been living in the house where 30s actress Jean Harlow's husband, Paul Byrne, had killed himself decades ago. Ironically, this article in the Los Angeles Times wondered idly who the unknown assailants were. Well, an article right next to it answered the question. On August 16, 1969, sheriff's deputies raided the Spawn Ranch and arrested most of the family suspected of auto theft. They were released shortly thereafter for lack of evidence without the police ever suspecting that they had had in their custody most of those involved in the murders. Of all the masks that Manson has been given to wear, it must be said once and for all that the most blatantly false is that of Manson the mass murderer. That Manson was not present at any of the murders, that his name is inextricably connected with, is a simple fact of history. Indeed, it has never been shown in a court of law that Manson has ever killed anyone. And yet he is known as a killer, a butcher, a murderer of unborn babies. There have been far grislier murders than these, and yet every media hack feels compelled to refer to them as the murders of the century, if not of all time. Had the victims been five anonymous individuals, who would have noticed or cared? Somehow the murder of a movie star is deemed the worst taboo that can be transgressed in our culture. Perhaps it is only America's drooling morbid curiosity for the death styles of the rich and the vapid, a soap opera to be lived vicariously with hypocritical tongue clucking and a copious flow of tears to mitigate their ghoulish guilt at being titillated by death. To even speculate on the motives behind the murders is a moot point, but it is generally assumed that they began with the similar murder of Gary Hinman, a music teacher and drug dealer committed by family member Bobby Beausoleil in July of 1969. 
A partial motive for the Tate murders may have been to give the impression that Beausoleil could not have been the murderer. Manson ruefully recalls the day that Beausoleil told him of his desire to kill Gary Hinman due to a drug deal gone wrong. I know when I've done something when I didn't do something. And someone comes to me and they say, I got a problem. I said, what is it? And they said, will you help me? I said, sure, I'll help you. He said, well, can I be your brother? I said, sure, I'm your brother. I'll help you do anything. What is the problem? He said, the guy owes me some money. I said, well, if you're big enough, go get it. If you ain't, sit down and keep your mouth shut. He said, what would you do? I said, fuck it, man. It's the only money. I wouldn't put my life up for no fucking money. You dig what I'm saying? He said, well, I'm going to go get my money. I said, well, that's up to you. It's got nothing to do with me. The guy went over and fucked the guy up and took his money. You dig what I'm saying? He come back and said, I killed the dude. I said, what the fuck you tell me for? What you tell me for? You making me a conspiracy to something? But the die had been cast, thus leading Charlie to seek sanctuary in Death Valley. I asked if he remembered the day that he was arrested for the final time. Yeah. One of these incompetent fucking assholes got me, put a pistol on me, and put handcuffs on me. And I've been in handcuffs for uh, 18 years. That's the only reality he's got, is me in handcuffs. It was here in this tiny cabinet in the Barker Ranch bathroom that Manson attempted to hide from police during the raid of the ranch. One of the arresting officers saw a string of matted hair sticking out of the cabinet. Hi, said Charlie. Today, the cabinet where Manson lived his last moment of freedom is gone. In essence, it seems that Manson is not serving his life sentence for murder, since he was at no time ever accused of murdering anybody, but for his subversive ideas, and because of the abstract notion that he is simply too dangerous. In a mockery of justice that was his trial, he was not allowed to defend himself. When he was finally given the right to testify in court, prosecutor Vincent Bugliosi argued that Manson's hypnotic powers might be too persuasive to the jury. Thus they were banned from hearing his testimony on the grounds that they might be convinced of Manson's innocence. During his testimony, that was delivered to an empty courtroom, Manson declared. These children that come at you with knives, they are your children. You taught them. I didn't teach them. I just tried to help them stand up. You can send me to the penitentiary. It's not a big thing. I've been there all my life anyway. What about your children? These are just a few. There is many more coming right at you. Don't. Blame me for falling in love with you. Blame charms that melt in your arms, but my grandma don't blame me. Can't you see? When you do the things you do, say that you're saying, or pray that you're praying, but don't blame me. I can't help it if that doggone moon won't shine. All that stuff that's right, you've been standing on the sunshine, and don't. I never told you 